Hey sup, welcome back to our channel and have a nice day, so in this video we are gonna see, what if demigod Naruto son of Thor, this is part 4, and if you want more then please leave a like share and subscribe. Let's get in the video. Ka-san. Look what I did. Naruto said, running up to his mother with a large grin while in his hands was a small flame. Though not overly impressive, Kashina Uzumaki still smiled proudly at her son, crouching down and patting him on the head. Very impressive, Naruto-chan. Being able to create even a small flame already, you'll be a natural when you're older. Although, we can do a lot more than just create fire, like this. Said Kashina before holding out both her hands, creating two blue fireballs in each of them, much to Naruto's amazement before he looked at her in confusion. But you just created more fire. Said Naruto, confused at how it's different from what he did, with Kashina only smiling in amusement. It may look that way, but tell me which one is real and which is fake. Kashina said, making the whiskered redeed look between the fireballs, not really seeing a difference. With both fireballs being the same size and shape, along with feeling heat coming from both of them. It made Naruto unsure how he was supposed to tell the difference when he didn't see any. Maybe if I Naruto thought, reaching out to touch one of the fireballs, since if one of them was fake, that meant it wouldn't be able to hurt him. Only to yelp and quickly pull his hand back when it started burning from the fire, before looking at the other fireball, realizing that was the fake one. Reaching out to see what made it fake, Naruto pulled his hand away again when it started burning. Ka-san. Both of them are real. Naruto said, holding his hand, with the woman's smile growing. Are you sure? Let's test it shall we? Said Kashina before standing up while both fireballs remained where they were in the air. Going over to a tree, Kashina grabbed two leaves from them before going back over to her son. Holding the leaves in front of her, Kashina dropped both of them into the fireballs. Naruto watched in surprise as one of the leaves burned the moment it touched the fire, while the second passed harmlessly through. What? Said Naruto, grabbing the leaf in confusion, wondering how it wasn't even singed. It's an illusion, sweetheart. While it may look and feel real, it's not actually there and is simply what I want you to see. Kashina said, dispersing the real fireball, while the illusion suddenly changed from a fireball to a bluebird. Naruto smiled at the sight as the bird flew around before landing on his hand, much to his amazement, as he could actually feel the weight of it there. Before the bird then dissolved into mist, as if it was never there at all. But then why did it hurt when I tried touching it? Naruto asked, looking at his mother. It comes with age and experience, if you practice long and hard enough you can make illusions powerful enough that they seem real, tricking a person's mind into believing they're actually being burned. There are even those powerful enough that any damage caused by an illusion becomes real. Kashina explained, making Naruto look at her in awe. And you can do that, Ka-sen? Said Naruto, with Kashina nodding in response. That's right, and so much more. You'll be able to do the same once you're older and come far enough in your training. Replied Kashina, with Naruto grinning in excitement. Cool. Does that mean I'll be as strong as you? Questioned Naruto, excited at the idea of becoming as strong as his mother. With Kashina smiling at her son and patting him on the head. No you'll be even stronger. Kashina stated, knowing it wasn't just her power he inherited, but his father's as well. Alright. Then could we start training now, I wanna get really strong. Naruto said, with the woman giggling at his excitement. If you're that eager, why not? But I hope you're ready, because there's a lot you need to do if you want to become stronger than me. Said Kashina before grabbing his hand as they walked off to start his training. Real world. Naruto's eyes snapped open as he inhaled sharply at the dream he'd just had, before relaxing a little when he saw was still in the Hades's cabin. Only to gain a downcast expression at remembering the dream or memory he just had. I don't even remember the last time I could hear her voice or see her I don't even remember the last time I thought of her. Naruto thought, looking up at the ceiling, wondering how long it's been since he last heard his mother's voice or thought of what she looked like. Usually whenever he thinks about his mother, it's only the last time he ever saw her, what he was forced to hear and see when she was taken from him. Now to think of her before that moment, to happier times when he didn't have to worry about how he acted or behaved, it was nice. And a relief to know he could still remember his mother and the time they had together. Before the Uzumaki registered the weight on his shoulder, making him look only to smile to see Bianca's head lying on his shoulder as the daughter of Hades could be seen sleeping soundly. With him also seeing Naiko Kong out on the floor in front of the television, that's still on. Reminding Naruto what they had been doing before they fell asleep. 
After they finished training for the day and returned to the cabin, they had a movie night, something they used to do at Westover whenever they had the time. With the siblings having wanted to watch some movies to give them inspiration on using their powers. Leading to them watching several different movies before falling asleep at some point. I'm sure Naiko will be excited to try out everything he saw. Even Bianca started to get excited. Naruto thought while smiling slightly, happy that they've started getting more settled with everything they learned and being demigods. It also helped him relax more now that he didn't have to hide anything from them anymore, having not liked it once they grew closer. With Naruto not even realizing when he started letting his guard down around them, only that he did and was able to let them in. The only other person he was able to let in after his mother was Drud. Not needing to act how everyone else expected him to be, to live up to being the son of Thor or maintaining the walls he's placed around himself over the years. Instead, he could simply be himself around her. Doesn't mean she won't be completely pissed off at me for running away. Naruto thought dryly, knowing if Drud ever finds him she'll use him as her new training dummy. Looking at Bianca and Naiko, Naruto gently lifted the brunette off his shoulder before picking her up, being careful not to wake her. With him taking Bianca to her room and putting her in bed, before doing the same with Naiko. I need some air. Thought Naruto, turning off the television, doubting he'd be able to sleep after that dream, along with not wanting to risk having another dream that'd turn into a nightmare. Exiting the cabin, Naruto released a breath and looked around, seeing how different a camp was at night without anyone outside. Only to soon notice someone sitting by the hearth in the center at the cabins, already knowing who it was before he went over. Is it alright if I sit here? Naruto asked, looking at Hesta, with the goddess smiling at him while she tended to the hearth. Of course, I did say you would be welcomed by my hearth at any time. Replied Hesta, making Naruto nod before he sat down and looked into the fire. I take it you had trouble sleeping. Hesta stated after a few moments. Not really, I just didn't want to go back to sleep, not wanting to see anything when I closed my eyes. Naruto said, with Hesta nodding in understanding. Do you perhaps wish to talk about it? Hesja asked, looking at the whiskered redeed, only for Naruto to shake his head. No, it's not something I really like talking about to anyone. No offense. Replied Naruto, having never talked to anyone about his mother or what happened to her. He didn't even talk to his father about her since Thor never tried bringing her up, and it was still too painful for him to even think about his mother. And by the time it became bearable, he figured there was no point in them trying to talk about her. Okay, but if you ever want to, I'm here whenever you're ready. Said Hesja, smiling at the Uzumaki, with Naruto nodding in response. But if you don't mind me asking, what happened between you and Artemis? Hesja asked while looking at Naruto, having felt something change in her niece a few nights ago, and felt that Naruto was involved. Even now she could sense Artemis in her cabin, feeling the jumbled mess her emotions now were, a far cry from her usually focused and reserved demeanor. I simply told her the truth she either ignored, refused to accept, or didn't see for herself. Clearly no one ever tried making kid number two see what a spoiled selfish brat she is. Naruto said, making the goddess frown. Artemis is a good and kind girl. Does she have her flaws? Yes. But she also has many positive traits and qualities. Said Hestia, knowing compared to most of the gods, Artemis is one of the more sympathetic and selfless Olympians. Tell that to Callisto and Atalanta. Retorted Naruto, causing Hesta to fall silent before frowning sadly. That's it then. Hesta muttered, now realizing what must have happened and why her niece feels more subdued and closed off. While Hesta truly loved her entire family, she wasn't blind to their faults or the terrible things they've done throughout history. And one of the things she truly hated was what Zeus and Aphrodite did to those poor girls. With Zeus raping Artemis's best friend and Aphrodite all but forcing one of her followers into a marriage she didn't want. Though she could never truly hate her family, Hesta did feel disappointed, avoiding both of them for a few centuries, unable to even stand being in their presence. Even worse was what happened to Callisto, what Artemis did to her had only further disappointed Hesta. Especially since she'd been able to guess what would happen to Callisto if Artemis simply sent her away. She would have been targeted by Hera just for the fact she was one of Zeus's lovers, no matter how unwilling she had been, and pregnant with his child. Even if Hera saw for herself the pain and despair Callisto went through, she wouldn't care as she'd let her jealousy and anger control her. Though Hesta didn't say anything to Artemis nor did she avoid her like she did with Zeus and Aphrodite, after what they did. 
having sensed that despite her actions, her niece felt her own pain and sadness at what she did, leaving the hearth goddess unable to make her feel even more sorrow. Yeah, that's it then. She did nothing to help Callisto or Atalanta when they needed her the most. If she gets upset over finally realizing that, then good. It still doesn't compare to the pain she's inflicted on others. Naruto said, making Hestia sigh while poking the fire. Just please try and give her a chance before judging her. Said Hestia, hoping he'd be willing to give Artemis a chance. This is me giving her a chance. What'll happen next depends on her. Said Naruto, knowing he's giving Artemis a chance to show what she's really like. This made the hearth goddess eye but not, figuring that's the best she'll be able to get, but had confidence in Artemis being able to show she is good. So if you don't mind me asking a personal question. Naruto said, looking at Hestia. I don't mind, ask whatever you'd like. Hestia said, not minding if he wanted to ask her something. Why did you decide to become a virgin goddess? Questioned Naruto, finding it confusing that Hestia, a goddess of family, wouldn't want a family of her own. I was just never interested in finding a partner or becoming a mother. I preferred being like my aunt Themis, acting as a mediator and peacekeeper among the gods, it also suits me just fine to stay in the background. Besides, I have plenty of nieces and nephews to look after, so not having my own children is alright. Replied Hestia, only for Naruto to look at her with an unconvinced expression. The goddess of family never desiring to have a family of her own, sorry, but I don't believe that. You've never once even thought about it, seeing the rest of the gods have children of their own. Hell even kid number two has her girl scouts as children, and Athena, despite being a virgin goddess herself, still has kids. Have you really never desired to have your own? Naruto asked, refusing to believe Hestia never even thought what it'd be like to have children of her own, whether having her own biological children or adopting ones as her followers. Though he frowned when the heart flames began dimming, making him look at Hestia again only to see her solemn expression. I never really got the chance to think about it. Hestia said, making Naruto's frown deepen. You already know how my father swallowed me and my siblings, afraid that we would overthrow him after learning we were born as gods and goddesses. But it's not well known that I remember the very moment he swallowed me, vividly. Even as just a baby, I knew what was happening, and I was terrified that my own father was going to eat me whole. And I could never forget hearing my mother wail in despair, being helpless to stop him from eating her children. Then to be trapped in darkness for who knew how long, only being able to tell when another of my siblings joined me. Said Hestia, with the whiskered redeed looking at her with white eyes. You really remember all that? Do the others? Naruto asked, wondering if the other elder Olympians remember Chrono swallowing them. If they do, then they likely don't like talking about it, nor remembering the time we were trapped. But that's why I chose to become a virgin goddess, because I didn't want to take the risk of having a partner like Kronos, being bound to someone so cruel, heartless and power-hungry. Or being helpless like my mother, unable to do anything if my children are endangered. I'd rather never have my own family if it meant I'd have to go through any of that again. Hesta explained. Okay, I guess I can understand that it put anyone off from getting married or having kids. But that's only one example, and Kronos was always a power-hungry asshole, so you shouldn't really let what he did affect what you do. Said Naruto, with Hesta shaking her head. It's not just him, I've seen it happen before. I love my family, I do, but I'm not blind to their faults. I've seen for myself that Zeus can be just as bad, if not worse than our father, he swallowed his first wife just to subvert a prophecy of their son overthrowing him, his marriage to Themis lead to the fates being born, and I've honestly lost count of the number of times he's cheated on Hera. Then the incident with Priapus who tried raping me while I was asleep and would've, if it wasn't for my donkey. Then Poseidon and Apollo both tried proposing to me, but I'd already seen enough times to know neither of them would have remained loyal either. I was just I was tired of it all and chose to remain a virgin, so I didn't have to worry anymore. Said Hestia, with Naruto frowning at her explanation. And you never really had a chance to think about it. Naruto stated, with the hearth goddess nodding in response. No I didn't. Maybe maybe part of me did want a family of my own, but I just never had time to think about it, or even try finding a partner. So I simply didn't try and accepted looking after my family's children, instead. Hestia said, accepting that having a family of her own likely wasn't a possibility. With the Uzumaki's frown deepening at her words, before turning back towards the hearth. Well if it's any consolation, I believe you deserve to be a mother more than any other Olympian. 
said Naruto, making Hesta look at him curiously. What makes you say that? questioned Hesta. Well, aside from the fact you're the goddess of family, you have a very calming and warm aura, you have over thousands of years' worth of experience dealing with the children in your family, you make an effort to look after their kids when their parents barely even acknowledge them. And like you said, you act as a peacekeeper so you'd never lose your temper with them. And after how long you've acted as a mediator for the rest of your family, being able to have a family of your own, something that'd truly be yours, it's the least you deserve. I also doubt you'd let anything stop you from raising any children you had yourself, even if they're demigods. So, I really believe you'd be a great parent. Naruto said, with Hesta looking at him in surprise before she smiled gently at him. That really means a lot, thank you. Said Hesta, touched to hear the belief he had in her being a parent. I'm just telling the truth, if it's something you want then you shouldn't be afraid to try and get it. Plus one other reason, with all your experience and seeing the kind of parents the rest of your family have become, you'd also know how to be far better. Said Naruto, causing the hearth goddess to giggle lightly. That's a fair point, I suppose. Hesta stated before she saw Naruto stand up. I think I'm gonna try and get some sleep, now. It was nice officially meeting you, Hesta. Naruto said as the goddess nodded and smiled in response. It was nice meeting you as well, Naruto. Said Hesta, waving to the Uzumaki as he returned to the Hades's cabin, while she turned her attention back to the hearth. Though the goddess couldn't help but look back at the son of Thor in interest. Next day. Friday had finally arrived, and with it the annual capture the flag game, though rather than it being campers against campers, it was campers against hunters. With Naruto having noticed the closer it got to Friday, the harder the campers seemed to be training. He would have been impressed if it wasn't for how they were only training so hard over a game. The Uzumaki also noticed how the hunter seemed to be particularly eager for the game, given he's heard they've won 55 times in a row, much to the dismay of the campers and Chiron. At the moment though, Naruto was in meeting with the rest of the camp counselors, along with several other campers as well, with the meeting having been called by Chiron. With all of them gathered in the rec room of the big house around a ping pong table. You all know in just a few short hours, we will be starting the capture the flag game against the hunters. I've called you all here so that we may begin working on a plan to win. Said Chiron, looking at them all with a serious expression before it turned into a desperate, pleading one. Does anyone have a plan to win anything Chiron said, not wanting to go through another year of the hunters defeating them. A sentiment the rest of the campers felt, aside from Naiko and Bianca given this would be their first capture the flag game. I have an idea. Thalia said, getting everyone's attention, the campers looking at her hopefully. We unleash whiskers on the hunters. Said Thalia, pointing at Naruto, knowing he'd be able to destroy the hunters and let them finally win a game. This made everyone turn towards Naruto, who looked at them with a raised brow. Who says I'm part of this? I'm only here because Bianca and Naiko chose me as their cabin counselor. Naruto said, not interested in taking part in any game let alone one that involved play fighting. Is there any way we can do to convince you to participate? Chiron asked, feeling unsure about letting the son of Thor take part given his power, but he's also desperate and willing to take the chance, as long as Naruto didn't end up maiming or killing any of the hunters. No. Said Naruto. Come on Whiskers, aren't you even just a little interested in fighting the hunters? Getting the chance to take them down a few pegs and show how much better you are. Said Thalia hoping he'll like the idea of fighting the hunters. Not really, I have no reason to prove I'm better than them, I already know I'm better. Replied Naruto, already knowing he could defeat any of the hunters, even if they all attacked him together, so he didn't see any reason to prove something he already knew. But what about getting the chance to fight Andromeda? Annabeth asked, making Naruto look at her with a raised brow. She is one of the strongest demigods alive at the moment, with her being even stronger after becoming a hunter. Wouldn't you want the chance to see what she can do for yourself, fighting the demigod that managed to injure Ares, recover the Golden Fleece, and defeated the best swordsman we had in 300 years? Annabeth said temptingly, guessing that being raised among gods that lived for fighting made Naruto eager to always get a challenge, making her appeal to his warrior side. Knowing she had him when he looked intrigued at the idea of facing off against Andromeda. You could also see how we've progressed with your training too, seeing how we compared to the hunters, most of who have years, even decades or centuries, worth of experience at the least. Bianca added, wanting the chance to show Naruto how far they've come with his training, 
as Naruto looked at the campers blankly for a moment before he began chuckling in amusement. You know, the funny thing is that I know you're all playing me but you're right. Naruto said as that made the majority of those present look on, hopefully. All right already. I'll be part of your little game. Naruto said, rolling his eyes, making the campers cheer in excitement, believing they'll finally win with a demigod as strong as the whiskered redeed on their side. But that doesn't mean I'm holding anyone's hand. I'll fight the kid, but the rest of you will be getting the flag and protecting yours. Added Naruto, refusing to do everything for them or take out all the hunters to let them win. That's perfectly acceptable and we're glad to have you taking part, Naruto. Chiron said, eager for the chance to finally defeat the hunters. Right. For starters how many will be taking part? Naruto asked, figuring if he's going to take part, then he's going to make sure they had an actual plan. Including you, there's 16 campers. Me, Thalia, Beckendorf as son of Hephaestus and two of his brothers, a few Ares members, Connor and Travis stole from Hermes's cabin, Selena and some of her siblings, Bianca, and Nico. While the hunters will have 16 too, to keep things even, the only members I know for sure will be part of the game are Zoe and Andromeda. Replied Annabeth, knowing the teams are smaller given how many demigods left camp for the winter holidays. And did you have a plan beyond just having me fight them, Thalia? Said Naruto, looking at the daughter of Zeus, who smirked in response. Of course. Selina would lead a decoy party to draw as many of the hunters away. While I lead the main party in going after their flag and catch the rest by surprise. Thalia said, with Naruto nodding along with it. Seems good I suppose. Only a few problems, for starters no matter how well any of you know the forest, the hunters will know it better as they spend a lot more time in the wilderness. Next is the fact they'd likely have their fastest member be the one going after the flag, I'm guessing that'll be the princess who'd be the most familiar with all your tactics. And you're focusing too much on offense rather than defense, which is much more concerning as the instant one of them get your flag, you'll either need to move faster than them or accept you've already lost. Naruto said, making Thalia frown but not in understanding. Annabeth. Said Naruto, looking at her expectantly, wanting to see if her training's made off and strategizing. He's right on all points, Zo is the one most likely to go after the flag, she's faster than any of us, and will be prepared for anything we would have in store. The only other one would be Andromeda, who'd also know what to expect, but with Naruto taking part, she'll be kept busy. As for Delia's plan, it's good to have two groups, one serving as a distraction and the other to go for the flag. But it's also expected, so there should be a smaller third group moving quietly through the forest towards their flag. As for who it should be, me and Bianca. Annabeth explained, with Bianca looking at her in surprise. Me? Said Bianca, not expecting the daughter of Athena to want her help in getting the flag. Yes. With the progress you've made, you'll be able to hide us in the shadows, while my invisibility cap will help me be able to move ahead to check for any traps or hunters lying in wait around their flag. I would be able to distract them long enough for you to slip in and grab the flag, then jump into the shadows. Said Annabeth, confident they'd be able to get in close and get the flag if Thalia doesn't get to it in time. As for those guarding our own flag, Beckendorf and his brothers along with Connor and Travis, all of you will work together in setting up some defenses around the flag. As no offense to any of you, but Zoe wouldn't have much trouble getting past any of you, so the best we can do is slow her down, along with any of the other hunters that go with her. Annabeth said, looking at the demigods who will be the guards. I'm sure we'll be able to think of a few ideas said Beckendorf with a smirk along with his brothers, getting some ideas for the traps they could create. Don't forget us, it'll be fun to get a few over on the hunters. Travis said, him and Connor being eager at the chance to mess with the hunters. Nico, you'll also be part of the guard since, like Bianca, you can hide in the shadows and move around them fast enough to distract the hunters and keep them from reaching the flag. Said Annabeth, with Nico grinning and nodding. I'll make sure they don't even touch it. Nico replied, eager to use his powers in a fight, even if it was just a game. Annabeth then looked at Naruto to see what he thought of her plan, if it was good or anything needed to be improved, or if he had anything to add. Only to see the Uzumaki nodding in approval. Making her smile, pleased he approved her plan. One other thing, have another group following you and Bianca, have them act as cover while you two hide in the shadows. That way any hunters you come across will be more focused in the demigods they can see, and not the ones they can't. Naruto said, with Annabeth nodding in agreement, seeing it'd be good to further hide their movements. 
with the campers feeling excited and much more confident that they'll really be able to defeat the hunters this time. Later. After dinner the game had begun, with the campers taking the west woods and the hunters taking the east woods. The campers placed their flag at the top of Zeus's fist, a large cluster of boulders that apparently looked like a fist from a certain angle. Naruto personally thought it just looked like a pile of deer droppings, no matter how you looked at it. Though it was a good place for the flag, given the top boulder was 20 feet tall and difficult to climb, but he doubted it'd be trouble for the hunters to reach the top or find a way to knock the flag down. Once the horn had sounded and the game began, Selena's group ran into the wood to the left, followed by Thalia's group going in a few seconds after them. Then Annabeth's and Bianca's group went last going to the right. With Bianca shrouding her and Annabeth in shadows, hanging a little behind their group, ensuring she and Annabeth were hidden and wouldn't get caught in any fighting by staying too close. While Naruto headed towards the creek, which served as the border for the game and simply waited, knowing Andromeda would likely show up soon. And knowing any other hunter would avoid him, no matter how badly they'd want to shoot him. With it not taking long before a silver arrow came shooting out of the trees at him, the whiskered redeed merely looked at it boredly as it bounced off his shield. It seems you're slower than I originally believed if you've already forgotten that doesn't work, kid. Naruto stated as Andromeda came out of the trees, looking at him in annoyance. Yeah, you're really strong hiding behind a shield like that. Are you scared to actually get hurt? Andromeda asked tauntingly, with Naruto raising a brow at her before his lightning shield momentarily became visible before it then dispersed. There, it's gone. Not that it matters since you still said Naruto before swinging his axe deflecting Andromeda's next arrow. Won't be able to hit me. Naruto finished deflecting her next arrow before he began walking towards the ravenette, as she kept firing arrow after arrow at him, with each one being deflected. Andromeda continued shooting arrows at the Uzumaki, only for none of them to so much as scratch him, while he kept approaching her. Though rather than worrying or getting angry, Andromeda made sure he kept his focus on her, while she concentrated on pulling water out of the air behind him. Waiting until she had a large amount before separating it into spikes, then solidifying them. Once that was done, Andromeda smirked before having the water spikes launch themselves at the son of Thor's back. Only for Naruto to instantly turn around and fire a blast of lightning, vaporizing the spikes before they reached him. With him then turning again and blocking Andromeda's downward strike with Riptide. Your eyes gave you away, you might have been looking in my direction, but you weren't looking at me. Naruto stated before slamming his foot into Andromeda's stomach, making her gasp in pain at the strike as she went flying back. The daughter of Poseidon acted on instinct, pulling more water from the air to catch her before she hit the ground. Before the water moved her out of the way when Naruto threw the Leviathan axe at her, with Andromeda rolling across the ground and sculling at him. Then how's this? Retorted Andromeda as a large wave shot up from the creek and crashed down onto Naruto. Seeing the wave coming down towards him, Naruto jumped out of the way, shooting a bolt of lightning at Andromeda. Only for her to pull some of the water towards her and freeze it, with the lightning destroying the ice, though it still kept it from hitting her. Though when Naruto landed on the ground, he was surprised when the snow shot up and wrapped around his body like they were chains. Before it was then frozen together, leaving him trapped and unable to move. And thanks for your advice about using the snow, before. I guess you can say something useful once in a while kitty. Andromeda said with a smirk only for Naruto to smirk as well. Too bad you still need to be better than this. Said Naruto before breaking free of the ice and recalling his axe. Once it was in his hand, Naruto aimed at Andromeda before throwing it, forcing the ravenette to roll out of the way. But was shocked and quickly raised Riptide when the axe turned and came right back towards her. Gritting her teeth when the axe clashed against Riptide, pushing her back a little, but managing to deflect it. Only for the axe to once again turn and come back towards her, making Andromeda jump out of the way, wondering why the axe kept following her. But before she could think on it further, she gasped in pain when Naruto took the chance to rush her, slamming his elbow into her face. Followed by bringing his knee up into her stomach, knocking the wind out of her. Come on kid, I was hoping for a challenge. Naruto taunted, making Andromeda grit her teeth in anger before the hunter slammed her fist into his face, knocking the Uzumaki back. Before she then willed the entire creek to rise up and begin swirling around, adding the snow into the mix, forming a mass of icy water vortex. With Andromeda giving a shout and launching it towards Naruto. Seeing the vortex coming at him, Naruto held his arms out before clapping his hands together, unleashing a powerful shockwave. 
powerful enough to disrupt the vortex, sending water and snow flying everywhere, soaking both him and Andromeda. Feeling herself become energized at the water hitting her, Andromeda rushed at Naruto even faster than before, swinging riptide at him. With the son of Thor instantly recalling his axe and blocking the strike. Pushing Andromeda back, Naruto swung his axe up at her, only for the Ravenette to jump back before lunging forward again. Sidestepping her thrust, Naruto ducked down when Andromeda then spun around him, swinging her blade at his back. Only for the whiskered Reed to hook his axe around her leg and pulled it out from under her, knocking Andromeda to the ground. Though this didn't keep her down long, with her kicking her legs out, slamming them against Naruto's chest and knocking him back, using her momentum to kick herself up to her feet again as well. Looks like there is a fighter in you, after all. Naruto stated with a smirk while Andromeda glared at him. And it looks like there's still just an arrogant ass in you. Said Andromeda before charging him again. Only to feel a little confusion when he hooked his axe behind him again, but wasn't going to complain if he was proving her point about being arrogant and leaving himself open. Before her eyes widened in shock when Thalia, Annabeth and Bianca came running out from the hunter's side of the forest, with the daughter of Hades currently carrying their flag. Raising her hand to stop them from crossing the stream, Andromeda was shocked when she felt a small jolt of electricity hit her before her body became unresponsive. Leaving her unable to do anything but watch as the three jumped over the creek and won the game. Looks like we win, kid. Naruto said in her ear, much to Andromeda's anger as she soon was able to move her body. What did you do? Andromeda demanded, angry and not believing the hunters actually lost, having been confident they'd win after Zo told them how the campers always did the same strategy every time. So she knew Naruto must have done something that helped them win, as Zo should have already been back by now with their flag. Me? I didn't do anything, everything else was all them. I only gave some advice and got the chance to fight you. Said Naruto, smirking at the daughter of Poseidon. He's right, cousin. Looks like the hunters aren't so great, after all. Thalia said tauntingly, relishing in the fact they've defeated the hunters, even more so at the look on Andromeda's face. You wanna go too, Pinnacone face. Said Andromeda, glaring at Thalia next. Bring it seaweed brain, I'm not afraid to hit a little kid said Thalia, smirking at her, while angering Andromeda further. Though before either of the girls could try anything, Chiron came out of the woods, looking like he was about to cry in joy, followed by Dionysus and Artemis, as the latter looked on in disbelief. The goddess having a hard time believing her hunters actually lost. The campers win. Chiron declared, feeling complete joy that the campers were finally able to beat the hunters. With the rest of the campers arriving, cheering loudly at seeing they'd won the game. The hunters soon appeared as well, looking defeated and dejected at losing. With a few also having difficulty moving due to their uniforms either being uncomfortably tied around their bodies or baggy enough that they kept tripping after Selena and her siblings messed with their clothes. While Zoe and the hunters that went for the flag were covered in dirt, snow, and constantly scratching themselves after being hit with itching powder from the Stoll brothers. Along with them seeming to go out of there to avoid stepping close to any shadows. Please forgive us, Mladi, we failed you. Zo said, bowing her head in shame along with the other hunters, upon seeing that they actually lost to the campers. It's it's fine girls, you you all did your best. Artemis said, while wondering how the campers could have succeed in beating her hunters. Before she looked at the son of Thor, who smirked and waved tauntingly at her, showing Artemis just who was responsible for their victory. Good job on winning the game Bianca. Naruto said, turning to the brunette, smiling at her, which Bianca returned. Th thanks. But Annabeth and Thalia just cleared the way for me, Annabeth got one of the hunters guarding the flag to shoot a tripwire at her when she revealed herself. And Thalia made sure to keep them off me when I went for flag. Said Bianca, doubting she'd have gotten away without their help. Then all three of you helped us win the game. And look at those hunters, none of them expected their clothes to suddenly start shrinking or getting too big, that they could name properly. Selena said, smirking in satisfaction at the hunters, happy they won and she got to show them just how worthless love is. I also made sure no one got the flag. I stayed in the shadows and kept tripping them, it was pretty funny. Said Nico, snickering at remembering how the hunters kept looking for what was making them trip, never seeing him reach through the shadows and grab their ankles. Well then, all of you did a great job, and I'm glad to see all your training is really paying off. As you'll only keep getting better the more you work at it. Said Naruto, smiling at them all, pleased at hearing what they did, showing their training certainly helped them all improve.
Yes, yes, congratulations to all of you for winning. Now said Dionysus, rolling his eyes, though possessed a barely noticeable smirk at the hunters finally being defeated. Only for the wine god to stop as he and Artemis looked up, sensing that they were being summoned to Olympus, making them exchange a look at what's happened now. Chiron, make sure the brats don't end up killing each other before we get back. Said Dionysus before teleporting away. Zo, see that the hunters are gathered up and return to the cabin to wait my return. Artemis said before teleporting away as well. Olympus. Once Artemis and Dionysus appeared in the throne room, they saw all the other Olympians gathered together, aside from Apollo. The sight of her twin's empty throne making Artemis frown, wondering why he wasn't here. Has Apollo not arrived yet? Artemis asked, wondering if anyone's seen him, with the Olympians either shrugging or shaking their heads, while Zeus grunted in annoyance. No matter, let's proceed. Hermes, why did you call for a meeting? Demanded Zeus, annoyed at another unauthorized meeting being called, even more so if it has to do with another pantheon intruding on their territory. Only for everyone to look at the messenger god in confusion or concern at noticing just how pale he looked, along with the green tinge to his face. As well the box and letter he was currently holding in his lap. I ah uh, I I um I got this package delivered addressed to all of us. It um it said if if I didn't show everyone that said Hermes, only for his face to turn greener, before he quickly passed the box and letter to Artemis, and summoned a waste basket before he began throwing up in it. The sight shocking the gods, wondering what exactly the message could be to get such a reaction out of him. With Artemis shakily grabbing the letter on top of the box and unfolding it to see what it said. Messenger God, if you do not deliver this pack a gay and letter to the entire Olympian Council, then we will be sending more pieces of Apollo back to you Artemis read before she gained a horrified expression as she looked at the box that, if the message was telling the truth, had part of her brother inside it. The moon goddess nervously opened the lid and looked inside, only to immediately throw it onto the ground, with the contents spilling out onto the floor. All of them looking in shock, disgust, and horror when they saw what was inside was Apollo's severed genitals. Fuck. Ares muttered, unconsciously crossing his legs at the horrifying sight. Read the message, now. Demanded Zeus, angered at this now blatant attack on Olympus, that someone has potentially captured Apollo. Artemis looked at the letter with a shaken expression, unable to even begin saying anything at the knowledge someone has captured her brother and is now torturing him. Before Hermes held out his hand after taking a few moments calm down, with Artemis eagerly passing him the letter. To the Olympians hiding up on their mountain, we have your son god in chains after taking away his favorite toy he cried when we did. And soon we will have the rest of you chained as well, we will enjoy making you watch as Olympus burns before putting you all down like the rabid animals you truly are. But unlike you, we are not without mercy you have until the winter solstice to surrender yourselves. Do so and your endings will be swift don't and you will suffer, just as all your victims have suffered. If you choose to fight know that you will die, screaming and begging for the end that is our promise. But who Hermes said before stopping and gulped at the next part. Read it. Zeus said, his anger growing with each word. But two four of you animals, no matter what choice you make, your suffering will be an eternity before we let you die. Two to the rapist king, you will experience the same pain your bastard has experienced, along with all the pain of the women you have ruined to satisfy your own selfish desires and cruelty. Said Hermes while glancing at his father fearfully as Zeus was seen visibly shaking in pure rage, it's honestly a miracle he hasn't exploded. Two to the other p-petty ssp spiteful queen bitch no longer will will you pretend to be the spurned wife we will expose the the disgusting rot within your soul the truly selfish and self-centered creature you really are. To feel the pain you inflicted on the victimized woman and innocent children of your rapist husband. And when your time comes you will know you were no different than the men that no one will care when you die. Hermes said, glancing at Hera next. What? Screamed Hera in anger that anyone would dare insult her in such a way. To the other shallow whore pretending to be a love goddess for for the lives you have ruined to satisfy your your own twisted fantasies you will feel as they did to have your mind twisted and manipulated, you will become what you have made so many others nothing but a doll to be used and tossed aside once it's broken. Said Hermes, turning to Aphrodite next. How dare they? I've only ever brought people together. Aphrodite said, scowling that anyone would insult the couple she's created or say she's manipulated anyone. And and to the traitorous hunter we were hoping to capture you, but your twin does just as well. 
we will get you eventually and you will pay for your betrayal no that this began because of you and we will be the ones to end you to show you what it is like to be abandoned. Hermes said, looking at Artemis last, the moon goddess merely clenched her drone's armrests tighter. Enjoy enjoy the time you have left Olympians take one last look at your shining mountain for soon, nothing of it will remain but our laughter. Signed, the lion, the witch and the bear. Hermes said as he finished reading the letter. Before the Olympians all jumped when loud explosions of thunder and lightning began going off around them and above their heads, as Zeus shot up from his throne. I will have the heads of those that dare threaten my power. They think they can get away with such an insult the only ones who will be screaming will be them. Zeus shouted in pure rage that anyone would deliver such an insult to Olympus and to him above all else, swearing he'll make them and their allies suffer for this. Though before Zeus could continue to rage, Poseidon was in front of him and slammed him down into his throne, giving his brother a warning glare. Enough. You can either calm down or I will force you to calm down. Said Poseidon, refusing to let Zeus's temper tantrum end up destroying Olympus or causing damage to the world below. Poseidon. You dare yell Zeus, only angered further at Poseidon for daring to try and command him. Only to freeze when another hand grabbed his shoulder as Hades appeared behind him. We both dare, little brother. If don't stop, we will enact our duty as your older brothers and make you. Hades said, glaring down at Zeus with the king of the gods calling at being forced to back down, but knew he couldn't deal with both his brothers going against him. Now would any of you care to explain why I could hear explosions all the way in the underworld? Said Hades, walking around Zeus's throne, annoyed at the sudden rumbling he could hear and feel, being able to know it was another of his brother's tantrums. Before he paused when he saw Apollo's severed genitals on the floor, making him raise a brow at the unexpected sight. With the underworld king grabbing the letter when Hermes held it out for him, feeling a little surprised at what it said and what happened to Apollo. And here I thought I could hold a grudge. Hades muttered, unsure on whether he should be impressed or not, being able to just feel the spite and hatred that went into writing the letter. I'm going to go find him. Said Artemis, standing up while refusing to leave her brother to be tortured any further. Absolutely not. You will remain at Camp Half-Blood. Zeus said, much to Artemis's and several other Olympians's disbelief. What? Father please, Apollo is in danger. Whoever has captured him not only was strong enough to restrain him, but it seems even a way to permanently injure him. The fact he was tracking the bane of Olympus means that he said Artemis, desperate to go save Apollo if he's being held captive by the Titans. The Titans are not returning. This obviously a ploy by those warmongering Aesir. They already sent the drunken buffoon spawn into my territory, now they've captured Apollo. You will return to Camp Half-Blood and find out what the Aesir are planning. Zeus said, still refusing to believe the Titans are returning, instead believing it was a plot organized by the Aesir to overthrow him. It's not the Aesir or any other pantheon. Why would they even waste time capturing Apollo rather than just attack us? The only ones that'd benefit from this are the Tita Artemis said, now getting angry that his paranoia and denial could potentially put her brother in even more danger. Enough. You will return to Camp Half-Blood and watch that boy. Is that understood yelled Zeus, giving Artemis a warning look, with the moon goddess clenching her fists. Father, with all due respect there is no logical explanation as to why the Aesir would care to capture Apollo, nor have any knowledge of what he was doing to know where he was. Not even Odin's ravens would know since if they did see Apollo, then they would have seen Rudo Thorson by now as well. The only logical conclusion is that the Titans and their own allies are responsible, they would be the only ones to possess such a grudge against us to send such a message. Please see what all of us already do, monsters that have been gone for centuries are rising, more demigods are flocking to look Castellan. If we do not acknowledge the true threat, then what was written in that letter will come to pass. Do you really wish to risk even the smallest chance that the Titans are returning? Athena said, using all her logic and reasoning to get through her father's stubbornness and paranoia. With Zeus gritting his teeth in anger that even Athena believed the Titans were returning, even worse was he really couldn't argue with her, as she'd only make an argument she knew was true. Fine. Artemis you will send a team of hunters to find out where Apollo has been taken, and the truth of the matter on who attacked him. But you will return to camp and watch the Aesir to find out if he is plotting against Olympus, or if he's allied with the Titans. Zeus said, much to Artemis's relief that she could at least send some hunters to try and rescue Apollo, or at the very least find out where he's being kept, so she could save him herself. Yes, father. 
replied Artemis before she gave Adina a grateful expression, thankful that she helped her, which the wisdom goddess returned with a nod. Artemis then instantly teleported away, not wanting to waste another second and hoping her hunters will be able to reach Apollo in time. The moment Artemis arrived back at her cabin, the hunters all looked at her in concern upon seeing the panicked and worried expression on her face. Mladi, what's happened? Zoe asked, guessing something must have happened during the meeting to have their mistress look like this. Apollo's been captured by the Titans and is currently held captive by them. Revealed Artemis, much to the hunter's shock. What? How? Questioned Phoebe as despite their annoyance with the sun god due to him constantly flirting with them, he's still their mistress's twin and equal in terms of power. I don't know how or who specifically captured him, only that they have a very strong grudge against the Olympians. They had sent a message for Hermes to deliver, along with part of Apollo, to show they did have him as their prisoner. Artemis replied, still feeling sick and horrified at what must have happened and is currently happening to her brother. Then we'll prepare immediately to find Lord Apollo. Zoe stated with the rest of the hunters nodding in agreement, wanting to help save their mistress's brother, only for Artemis to shake her head with a scowl. I can't go myself despite the danger Apollo is likely in, my father refuses to let me leave Camp Half-Blood. Wanting me to continue watching the Aesir, even believing they were the ones behind Apollo being kidnapped. Thankfully, Athena helped in finally making him at least acknowledge the possibility that the Titans are returning and agreed to let me send a team of hunters to find Apollo. Said Artemis before looking at all her hunters, seeing all of them look determined to not fail her. I know many of you would wish to offer your help, but this won't be like any previous hunts you've been on. Whoever was able to capture Apollo not only was able to overpower him, but permanently injure him as well given the part they sent with their message. So, I'll only be sending a small team of the oldest and most skilled among you. Zoe, Phoebe, Parthenos, Naomi, Hunter and Iphigenia, you six will be going to find out where Apollo is and who took him. Be careful and do not take any unnecessary risks. Artemis said, looking at the six hunters, with all of them stepping forward. We won't fail you, Mladi. We'll do our best to locate Lord Apollo and see him safely returned. Said Zoe, making the moon goddess smile. I know you will, but please if things become too dangerous then save yourselves. And here, should you need me, break this and I'll appear. Said Artemis, holding out her hand before creating an arrow made of pure silver, refusing to take any chances and make sure her hunters had a way to summon her if things became too dangerous. With Zoe taking it and placing it in her quiver before Andromeda stepped forward as well. Lady Artemis, send me with them, I know what to expect from those that sided with the Titans, and while I'm not as experienced, I am strong. Andromeda said, wanting to go on the quest and help her fellow hunters, only for Artemis to shake her head. I know you wish to help Andromeda and are more than capable of handling yourself, but this quest won't be like the ones you've been on. It will be far more dangerous as there's no telling what will be encountered or who you could face. If I could, I wouldn't even be sending any of you and instead go by myself, but the best I can do is ensure the ones being sent are experienced and old enough to be ready for anything. Said Artemis, preferring if she was going herself, but with her father's orders the best she can do is choose the oldest and most experienced of her hunters. But I can said Andromeda, only to stop when Zoe put a hand on her shoulder. Thou will get a chance to prove yourself, Andromeda. But for now continue training and have faith in your sisters to succeed. Zoe said, with the ravenette frowning before nodding reluctantly. Good. Now, you six prepare and gather everything you could possibly need, you set out immediately. With the oracle not giving a quest and unable to give one with Apollo held captive, the only information we have is he was likely taken west after the monster he was sent after. Artemis said, with the six hunters nodding before they began gathering their supplies and weapons. With Artemis unable to help but feel nervous, only able to hope that nothing else will happen and her hunters will be safe. Time skip one day. With Naruto. The next day, Naruto had decided to give the others some time off from training with their performance during the capture the flag game showed how much they've improved. Giving them a chance to rest and relax before they continue training again. Plus, the Uzumaki wanted some time to himself after the dream he had of his mother, remembering what she was like before the incident. With him currently sitting against a tree in the forest, having come out here after breakfast to enjoy some peace and quiet. Before Naruto held out his hand and focused, with it taking a few moments before a flame began forming in his hand with it growing as he increased its power. 
only to frown at seeing it wasn't blue like his mother had been able to make, instead being regular orange-red yellow flames. Pyrokinesis and illusions. Naruto thought, looking over the flame, trying to remember a time he used them during his training only to come up blank. Only ever remembering using the powers he inherited from his father, never the ones he inherited from his mother. Though he supposed he should be thankful for that, not doubting his training would have been even more brutal if he showed he had other abilities. Was there anything else? I feel I feel there was more she showed me. More that she was capable of doing. Thought Naruto, frowning as he felt like his mother did have more powers besides pyrokinesis and illusions, he just couldn't remember what they were. Since when did your father have control over fire? Someone asked, making Naruto tense and quickly look up at the source of the voice, only relaxing when he saw it was Hesta sitting up in a tree. Hesta. Said Naruto, nodding at the goddess before looking back at the flame in his hand before he clenched it into a fist extinguishing it, while Hesta jumped down in front of him. Hello again, Naruto. I'm surprised you aren't already training. Said Hester as she smiled at the whiskered redeed with Naruto frowning slightly, as he noticed her smile didn't quite reach her eyes, and that it seemed more tense than it was the night before. I decided to give everyone some time off after how they performed and capture the flag, they earned some rest and relaxation. And I needed some time to clear my head and ponder on some things. Naruto replied, making Hester look at him curious before sitting in front of him. Does it have to do with the fact you somehow have pyrokinesis? How do you even have that, I've never heard of Thor being able to control fire. Hesta said, wondering if he was potentially a legacy on his mother's side and inherited it from another godly ancestor. It's not a power I got from my father. It's actually a power from my Ka-san, she could create fire, though hers was blue. She also could create illusions as well, ones that were strong enough to fool a person's mind into believing what they're seeing and feeling as real to the point that her illusions could create real physical damage. Said Naruto, smiling at remembering everything his mother told him, while Hester was surprised at this information. Wow, she must have been a very powerful demigod. Stated Hester, only for Naruto to shake his head. She wasn't a demigod, at least I don't think she was a demigod. She lived for a long time though, her illusions were only as strong as they were because of age and experience. She was not human, I think anyway. Naruto said with his smile turning into a frown honestly unsure what his mother was exactly, while the hearth goddess looking at him in sadness and understanding. You don't really remember her, do you? Hesta said softly, being able to sense the powerful bond Naruto had with his mother, but also felt how it was distorted and blocked, making her wonder what must have happened to affect their bond so much. No, I don't. The last thing I remember is Naruto said before stopping and clenching his fists, stopping himself from going back to the incident. Before he looked at Hestia when he felt a sudden feeling of ease and serenity wash over him, with the hearth goddess smiling reassuringly at him. It's okay, you don't have to talk about it if you don't wish to. Said Hestia, not wanting to bring up painful memories, the Yuzumaki nodding in thanks to her. But if you don't mind me asking, have you never used your pyrokinesis and illusions before? Hestia asked, given from what she's seen he's only used the powers he inherited from his father and nothing else. I only just remember I had them the other night. I know I did train with my ka to use them before, but I don't remember how to actually use them. This is about all I can do at the moment. Said Naruto, creating a flame in his hand, with Hesta looking at the flame. Hmm. <clears throat> well if you want I could help you learn to use them again. Offered Hesta, surprising Naruto at the sudden offer. You would teach me? Naruto asked, with the petite goddess nodding in response while smiling at him. Sure. While maybe I'm not a fighter like most of my family, I am the goddess of the hearth and fire, so I'm pretty skilled at using flames. Hestia said, holding out her hand and creating a fireball, with it looking to be more richly red than normal fire. Naruto was surprised again when his own flames were absorbed into Hestia's, making it grow larger and burn brighter, with it soon turning bright green, before Hestia clenched her fist and extinguished the fire. Just because I don't show off my powers doesn't mean I don't know how to use them, I just prefer a peaceful approach, rather than resorting to violence. Said Hesta, with Naruto looking at her and nodded at this. If you're willing to teach me, then sure. Naruto replied, making the goddess's smile widen. Great. We can start now if you'd like. Hesta said as the son of Thor nodded in response, wanting to get started on relearning his pyrokinesis as soon as possible. Later. 
Naruto trained with Hestia for a few hours, learning how to use his pyrokinesis again, having managed to begin creating more fire and shaping it without much difficulty. Though he had some trouble learning to absorb fire, like how Hestia had been able to do. With the goddess helping and breaking down how first he'd need to learn how to sense heat and thermal energy around him before learning to absorb it. Hestia also told Naruto several other abilities he'll be able to do with pyrokinesis, including being able to augment existing fire, heating up objects or cooling them down by manipulating their temperature, and channeling flames through weapons to enhance them. Along with how he'd be able to superheat objects, preventing them from being touched. As well as plenty of other abilities with Naruto also having his own ideas for how to use his pyrokinesis once he gets better at it. With the training ending after Naruto started getting a good grasp of manipulating his flames with Hesta also needing to leave, but not before telling the Uzumaki she'd meet him again tomorrow to continue. Something that Naruto appreciated, glad to have someone help him relearn pyrokinesis. It also helps that Hesta's training isn't do or die. Naruto thought dryly as he walked through the camp, knowing if he was training in Asgard, he'd either need to use his power, or else he'll end up dead, or at the least in a lot of pain. Hey Naruto. Someone called out, making Naruto stop and look to see Naiko waving at him from the archery field, seeing him standing beside a blonde boy holding a bow with a quiver on his back. The Uzumaki raised brow though when he saw Naiko was also holding an entirely black bow in his left hand, as well before he went over to the two, curious at what Naiko was doing. With him also getting a better look at the boy he was with, immediately seeing it's a son of Apollo. The boy looked to be 13 years old, while having the same shaggy blonde hair and blue eyes that Apollo had, along with seeming to already be developing a muscular and athletic build. Naiko, what's with the bow? And who's this? Naruto asked, looking between them. This will, a son of Apollo. He offered to help teach me archery since I came over here to work on firing out bolts of darkness. Replied Naiko with Will smiling and holding out his hand to the whiskered redeed. It's nice to meet you, I'm Will Solace, and like Death Boy said, I'm a son of Apollo. Will introduced as Naruto nodded and shook his hand. You too Will. And Death Boy? Said Naruto, smirking at the son of Hades, who looked annoyed at the nickname. He started calling me that when I tried summoning bones to make a bow, which would have been cool. I could just summon bone arrows, rather than having to carry any around. Naiko said, looking at Will in annoyance, while the blonde smirked at him. And it would have been creepy. Seriously just because your dad is Hades doesn't mean you need to have weapons made of dead bodies. Said Will while Naruto looked at Naiko's bow more closely, realizing it wasn't just entirely black, it was made of solidified darkness. Well it looks like you found a better alternative, anyway. Naruto stated, making Naiko green and hold his darkness bow out. Yeah. Watch this. Naiko said before drawing the string back, causing an arrow of darkness to appear. I don't even need to summon any arrows, I just pull back the string and they appear. That's not even the best part, though. Said Naiko as he then focused, causing the bow to transform into a sword, then a dagger and finally a shield before turning back into a bow which soon dispersed, while the son of Hades panted lightly but still smiled. I can make any weapon I want. But I'm still working on it since I need to concentrate a lot to keep them solid and change them around. And if I switch weapons too often I start getting tired. Naiko said, making Naruto smile proudly and pat him on the shoulder. Good job Naiko, give it enough time, and you'll start making a lot more things besides weapons. Naruto said, impressed that Naiko was already able to start creating weapons out of darkness. Thanks, I've really started getting a lot of ideas, especially after those movies we watched. Do you think I'd be able to create a black hole or at least a vortex of darkness that can suck in anything around it? Naiko said eagerly, imagining just creating a vortex and pulling monsters inside it. Probably, but don't try anything too big or dangerous until you get better control. We don't need the entire camp suddenly falling through a shadow portal. Warned Naruto, making the Dai Angelo nod in response, knowing he'd need to keep working on his control before doing something like that. And what about you Will? I'm guessing as one of Sunspot's kids you're already an expert archer. Naruto said, looking at Will, only for the son of Apollo to look down at his hands in annoyance. Actually I uh, I'm more of a healer than an archer. While most of my siblings are really great archers or musicians, or both, I mostly inherited my dad's power over healing. I can heal a person by singing a hymn in ancient Greek and sense the amount of damage from injuries. But my other powers aren't that great, though I can still shoot a bow, 
It's not on the same level as the rest of my siblings. So, I'm usually in the infirmary helping to heal any injured demigods as the camp's head medic. Replied Will, having always hated that he couldn't really fight like the rest of his siblings and the other campers. That's still a very useful skill, just because your power is focused more on healing doesn't mean you still aren't a fighter. What other abilities do you have? Naruto asked, making Will look at him. Oh uh, well I can also let out an ultrasonic whistle that's loud enough to stun anyone that hears it, especially those with sensitive hearing. And I can also emit a really bright golden glow. Will said, with the son of Thor nodding at this. Then you can still be a fighter and even improving your healing abilities. You can learn how to better focus that whistle you can make, so it only hits enemies or even focus it on a specific target, making it even more painful that they're the only one hit by it, which could leave them stunned or even knock them out from the sound. As for emitting a golden glow, imagine combining that with your ability to heal, and anyone that's hit by your light will have their injuries healed, letting you heal more than one person and still keep fighting while glowing said Naruto, much to Will's surprise at the ways he could use his powers. Huh, I never thought of it like that. Stated Will, knowing how much more useful he could be in a fight if he could heal others just be glowing around them. Just because your powers aren't suited for combat doesn't mean they're useless in combat. You just need to think of other ways to use them. Naruto said, making the son of Apollo nod, feeling more confident that he what could do to help his friends and allies in a fight. He's right. Maybe you could even learn to solidify the light and use it as a weapon. You could make light arrows to shot at enemies and blind them. Added Nico with Will smiling at this, knowing that'd really be a useful ability. That'd definitely be useful and a surprise. You could even learn to do the same, shooting darkness arrows that could leave enemies trapped in darkness, unable to see anything around them. Will said, liking the new ideas and ways to improve his abilities, while Nico grinned at the idea. The two soon began trading new ideas and different ways they could use their powers, with Naruto slipping away, unable to help but smirk. I'm sure Bianca will love to hear this. Thought Naruto, knowing the daughter of Hades would love to have something to get back at Naiko after all his teasing. Later. Do either of you think a few hunters are missing? And they look kind of tense? Bianca asked as she sat with Naruto and Naiko at the Hades' table for lunch, unable to help but notice how the hunters and Artemis looked tense, and seeing not all the hunters were present. Naruto and Naiko looked at the hunters' table, seeing all of them did look tense, and some were missing, most noticeably the lieutenant. They're probably annoyed that they still have to stay here or upset that they lost capture the flag. Said Naruto with a shrug, though still glanced at them, knowing that something big must have happened when Artemis and Dionysus were called away. Though he wasn't sure what, only that it seemed to have deeply affected Artemis enough that she's likely sent Zo and the other missing hunters away for whatever reason. I'm surprised I haven't been attacked yet. Thought Naruto, figuring if something bad happened then Zeus would immediately blame him just for the fact he's from a different pantheon. Before he saw Annabeth, Thalia and Selina coming over, with Bianca and Naiko noticing as well when the three girls arrived at their table. Though none of them made any attempt to sit down, feeling worried something would happen if they did. You can sit down if you want. We don't mind. Bianca said, with Nico nodding in agreement, neither of them minding if they sat at their table. With this helping the girls relax before hesitantly sitting down, only fully relaxing when nothing bad happened before they looked at Naruto. Remember, despite his reputation, Hades is one of the more mellow gods. As long as we don't mind you sitting with us, Nico and Bianca especially, he won't mind either. Though, I'm guessing you all have some more questions. Naruto stated, seeing the gleam in Annabeth's eyes he recognized whenever she had more questions, along with the curiosity in Thalia's and Selina's eyes. Yes. We want to know more about the other pantheons. Said Annabeth, eager to learn more about the other pantheons. We also want to know more about the Norse too. Thalia added, wanting to know what else there is to know about the Norse pantheon. Along with anyone else you know about the supernatural world. Selina said, curious to know if there's anything else he knew about, besides other pantheons. Naruto looked at them, seeing the curiosity and interest, glancing at Bianca and Naiko to see they were now just as interested to learn more as well. Making the whiskered redeed sigh before nodding in response. Okay, let's start with the Norse one. What do you want to know? Naruto asked, figuring they should start with the pantheon he's from. What else can you tell us about your family? Questioned Annabeth wanting to know about the rest of his family besides his father, stepmother, and siblings. 
Well there's my uncles, Balder, Heimdall, and Tur, though Balder is the one I interacted with the most. He's insane, completely and utterly insane. Said Naruto, knowing that's the best way to describe Balder. Isn't Balder supposed to be the god of light and peace? How can a god of peace be insane? Selina asked, confused at how that worked. He's also the one that's immune to any form of damage and injury, right? No matter what he can never be harmed. Anabith added, with Naruto nodding in response. That's right, no matter what you do to him he doesn't feel pain or exhaustion, he could fight endlessly without slowing down. Even if you stab him right through the chest and head, he'll just get back up. The most you could do is daze and incapacitate him, but only for a short time. But that's also the reason he was driven insane. Replied Naruto, confusing the demigods. Why would that drive him insane? It sounds pretty good, not needing to worry about any injury or getting exhausted. Thalius said, not seeing a downside to a power like that. You'd think that wouldn't you, that being immune to pain and exhaustion would be a blessing. But the truth is, Balder literally can't feel anything, he can't feel anything he touches, can't taste anything, can't smell anything. He could walk around completely naked in sub-zero temperatures and not feel so much as a chill, the same if he walked through molten magma. He can't taste anything he eats or drinks, it'd be no different than trying to eat air. And he feels nothing at all, pain or pleasure, nothing, you could put a hand on him and he'd only notice after looking. Imagine living for thousands of years without the ability to feel, taste, or smell anything, not even the ground you walk on. Naruto said, with the demigods paling a little at thinking of such an existence. Okay starting to see why he went insane. Said Bianca, knowing a life like that would be nothing but torture to feel nothing at all, as the others nodded in agreement. Who would make a curse like that? And what did he do to have it placed on him? Selina asked, thinking whoever made Baldur invulnerable did it to curse him to live with the inability to feel. It was his mother, right? Frigg. Anabith said, having read just how and who gave Baldur his invulnerability. His mom did that to him why? Said Thalia in disbelief that Baldur's own mother would do that to her own son. For starters there is no goddess by the name of Frigg, that's just a nickname Odin called Freya out of affection, and he started the rumor that there was another goddess named Frigg out of spite. Refusing to let Freya have any credit for the worthy deed she did. And yes, Freya was the one who made Baldur invulnerable, having done so after receiving a prophecy that he would die a meaningless death, and she refused to lose the only thing she cherished from her marriage to Odin. So, she cast a spell on Baldur making him invulnerable to all forms of damage and injuries, but it also left him unable to physically feel anything. Explained Naruto, making them frown. Still that she did that to her own son. Said Annabeth, shaking her head while Naruto shrugged. She was a mother that loved her son enough she'd do anything to ensure he would never die. But sometimes the things parents do out of love are also out of selfishness. She refused to lose her only child, even if that meant cursing him to live without ever being able to feel anything again. Naruto said, knowing what Freya did was unnecessarily cruel, but also understood why she'd do anything to protect her child. Being reminded of what his own mother did to ensure he wasn't killed during the incident. You said Baldur was the only good thing Freya had from her marriage to Odin. Does that mean she didn't want to marry him at all? Selina asked, getting curious looks from the others. Probably not, but Freya married Odin in order to bring an end to the Aesir Vanner War, wanting to bring peace to both sides, as she was the leader of the Vanner, while Odin was the leader of the Aesir. She obviously didn't want to do this, given her distaste for the Aesir, along with how they nearly killed her brother, Freyr. But Freya loved her people more than she hated the Aesir, so she agreed to marry Odin to save them, and if what I've heard is true, the two actually did have some affection for each other, enough for Odin to call her Frigg out of affection. But Odin really married Freya in order to learn her siege magic, as one thing Odin craves above all else is knowledge and hoarding it all for himself. Said Naruto. He hoarded any knowledge he could find. Why? Bianca asked with a confused frown. Control. The one thing Odin wants above all else is the ability to control his own fate, which is why he's obsessed with Ragnarok and learning how it can be prevented to avoid his own fate a death. But it's not just his own fate he wants to control, he wants to control everyone and every realm, to truly be all-knowing and all-seeing, but his desire for control also makes him afraid and paranoid of anything and everything that could prove to be the slightest threat to his rule. Though it's at least tempered by his desire for knowledge, making it so he acts more subtle in eliminating threats, rather than just outright destroying them.
I think the best way to describe him is that he's like a mafia boss, he prefers manipulating people, making them believe everything they do is their own choice. Making you believe you can do whatever you want when he's really the one pulling the strings, while simply giving subtle threats to remind them he's the one in charge. Naruto explained, with the demigods frowning at this. He sounds like an ass jerk. He sounds like a jerk. Said Naiko, quickly stopping himself when he saw Bianca narrow her eyes at him. That's putting it mildly. Said Thalia with a frown, already not liking Odin from the way Naruto describes him. Yeah, he's he's much worse than you could imagine. Naruto said while frowning, making the others look at him, wondering just how much worse Odin could be even after everything he told them. What about your other uncles, Heimdall and Tur? Bianca asked, interested to hear about his other uncles. Heimdall, I went out of my way to avoid, not only because he's a true believer in Odin and willingly following any of his orders without question, but mostly because he's a cocky, condescending, arrogant bastard that you just want to strangle. Naruto replied, scowling at just the thought about Heimdall. That bad, huh? Annabeth stated, imagining Heimdall was like the Ares's cabin members, enjoying antagonizing others and picking fights. He's much worse. He's the god of foresight, foreknowledge, and surveillance, which made him a good choice as watchman of the Aesir and herald of Ragnarok. But it's his foresight ability that makes him cocky, all he has to do is look into someone's eyes, and he'll instantly know any move they're about to make before they even make it, even being able to read someone's mind and thoughts. He can also move faster than anyone can react, helping him in dodging any attacks. Both of these abilities have made it so he's never been hit at all, which also makes it so people usually want to hit him with how he enjoys antagonizing others. Explained Hirudo. Yeah. I definitely want to strangle this asshole too. Said Thalia, knowing if she ever met Heimdall she'd want to strangle him if he so much as smirked. Take a number, there's a long line of people that want to. Naruto said, knowing plenty of people hate Heimdall for his abilities and arrogance. And what about her? Questioned Selina, wanting to know what his last uncle, though figured he's just as bad as the rest of his family is made out to be. That's the Norse god of war right? What's he like? Annabeth asked, only able to imagine a more bloodthirsty and violent version of Ares, if that's even possible. Another time. Since I need to relax after talking about my family, so much. Said Naruto, needing to relax and calm down after talking about his family and all the memories it brought up. With the demigods nodding and understanding before they switched to making small talk with each other and finishing their lunch. Later. After finishing their lunch, the demigods all went off to do their own thing around camp, with Selina heading to the Pegasus stables to tend to the Pegasi for the day. Selina. Naruto said, getting the Ravenette's attention and she was brushing one of the Pegasi, smiling at the Uzumaki. Hey Naruto. Did you need something or did you just want to enjoy my company? Said Selina while winking at him, only to notice the serious expression on his face. I was hoping you could answer a question for me replied Naruto, confusing the daughter of Aphrodite. Ah, sure. What did you want to ask me? Selina asked, only to pale when Naruto held up a bracelet, a bracelet that had a side charm on it. Mind telling me what exactly this is? Naruto said, making the ravenette gulp nervously. I it um looks like a charm bracelet. Said Selina while trying to remain calm, despite inwardly panicking and wondering just how Naruto got that. Selina, no one else know about this, and I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt as to why you have this. But that'll change if you don't give me the truth. Said Naruto, with Selina sighing in resignation and covering her face in shame. It's exactly what you think it is. Selina admitted, knowing she was done for, not doubting Naruto will tell the others she's a spy. Why? Naruto asked, wondering why Selina would join the Titans, given from what he's seen she didn't seem to have any issues with the Olympians, and was happy. With Selina looking at him in surprise, not expecting him to ask her what a reason for becoming a spy was, but was relieved he's giving her a chance to explain. It it was back when Luke was still at camp. Before he left, everyone really liked him, he was nice, supportive, helpful, and yeah he was handsome. And I was one of the ones that liked him, I wanted to be his friend, and thought he was handsome and charming. But he took advantage of that, he asked me to be his spy in camp, and I said yes, he gave me that bracelet to contact him with any information I learned. Explained Selina, cursing herself for letting herself be manipulated and used. What changed? Said Naruto, figuring something changed to make her no longer want to be a spy. 
Luke told me that by being his spy, I would be saving lives, that no one would get hurt, and I believed him. I wanted to help protect everyone even if that meant spying on them. But it didn't take me long to realize that by helping the Titans, I wouldn't be saving lives, I'd be getting people killed. I wanted to stop, but Luke forced me to keep working for him. He said if I didn't that he'd tell the rest of the camp, while promising that my siblings and friends wouldn't be hurt. So I kept acting as a spy and telling him everything I learned including about you. Selena said looking down in shame, knowing there's no excuse for her actions and deserved to face the punishment, befell her as a result of them. Only to look up when she heard the sound of something breaking, looking in shock to see Naruto crushing the bracelet in his hand until it was in pieces. The more I hear about this Larry guy, the more reasons I have to rip out his spine and hang him with it. Stated Naruto, his already low opinion of Luke going even lower. Oh why you mean Luke? Said Zelina in confusion at the wrong name. Whatever. Either way now no one else will learn about this. Naruto said, much to Selena's shock. Bee boo but I'm a spy and a traitor. I told him everything that's been going on and about you. Selena said, not believing he'd be willing to keep her secret. Because you were manipulated and then blackmailed by someone you thought you could trust. But anything he told you is a lie, including any promise about keeping your friends and siblings safe, as no one will be safe if the Titans return. As for him threatening to tell the camp, anyone who'd be willing to believe anything from a traitor is a fool, regardless if it's true or not. Said Naruto, going over and putting a hand on Selena's arm. You're not a bad person, Selena. You only made bad choices believing they were for the right reasons, that's not something you can be blamed for. Naruto said with Selena still looking at him in disbelief. I I don't know what to say. Said Selena, unable to deny how grateful she felt to be free of having to continue spying and betraying her friends. Don't say anything, just be better. Said Naruto with the ravenette smiling and nodding, before she hugged the Uzumaki. I will and thank you Naruto. Selena said, determined to make up for what she's done and help stop Luke and the Titans. That's it for today guys, hoped you enjoy this video, if you do please leave a like share and subscribe for more, thanks for watching.